coming up. People keep asking me if I got my rubber boots on or what. So anyway, I've got to go see what the Lord has planned and what he has to offer. I know what it is, I think. But I gotta do it because my wife won't talk to me, so I've got to go. Children's Church? Okay. How great is our God. That's what the song says. And the verse that we just read is, Hallowed be thy name. Holy be the name of God. And we're going to go over today one special name of God that can mean so much and should mean so much to His children. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the time that we can be here today. We just thank You for Your love that You pour out upon us, that You give us exactly the opposite of what we deserve, that You call us home and make us children. We just thank You for that, Father. We pray Your Spirit upon this place today, Lord. For those that have ears, have them to hear with the words of Jesus. And we just thank You and praise You. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Teach us to pray. Have you ever asked the Lord to do that for you? Maybe we should. Maybe we should do it all the time, like Merle said. So this past month, we've been going over a lot of things in the Gospel of Luke, especially from the chapters 9 through 11. We learned, if we didn't know before, Jesus' expectations and demands, and that He won't settle for anything less. Sometimes His teachings seem hard, but He is God. He gave up His life for us, and He doesn't want excuses. He doesn't want distractions. He wants all of your heart. And that means sometimes we need to let Him cultivate our heart. We don't have any excuses if we truly say we're going to follow after Him. And last week we even learned that Jesus said that if you're not with Him, you're against Him. And if you don't help Him gather, then you're actually scattering. And I ask you to think about that. And we're not really going to talk about it today. I hope you did think about this week and I hope the Lord spoke to you. We are at a decision time in our lives. Are we going to do what Jesus said or not? We saw the 70 went out. We saw that they came back with joy. We saw that they even said that demons submitted to them in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, don't be excited about that. But I'd be excited about that, I'm telling you. But He said, you should be so much more excited that your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. Luke says over and over that the kingdom of God has come. He calls it the kingdom of God where Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. And he's trying to get across first that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And now we see starting in Luke 9.51 that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows it's his final days. He's going to do the Lord's will. We even see where He says, Father, if you can take this cup from me, you know, do so. But He wants to do the Lord's will over whatever the cost is to Him. Because He knows the consequences. He knows that our souls are at stake. The souls of every person that has ever been, that Jesus can wipe away every sin, every tear, that He's going to destroy death and give us victory, which He did. We know that. These, these followers don't know that yet. They can only hope on the promise, but we know that. So we're supposed to follow in the steps of Jesus to be holy. It is God's will that we become holy, that we're a holy priesthood set apart for service, that it is His will that we be sanctified. 
So I'd like for you to grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to start reading. We'll get back to Luke. Don't let me confuse you. But let's start in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. And it starts out with, therefore, oh, wait a minute, I can't go any further, can I? Because i got to figure out what therefore means, right? Because therefore means that because of something Peter has just said, we're supposed to do something else, right? So flip back a page and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, this is who's writing this letter. Who was he? A fisherman? A coward? An ordinary man? A faithful man? No, he addresses himself as an apostle, right? One who is sent with orders. And we talked about that before. Paul says that we are all apostles. There are the twelve apostles, as I call it, with a capital A. But there are all the other apostles with a small a, and that includes us, because we can't deny that we are sent out in this world. That we have a mission. That we're ambassadors. That we're aliens in a foreign land declaring that Jesus Christ has come, the good news of salvation. <clears throat> if you're still breathing, you should be living for God, right? Now, it's not a part of salvation. Justification came through Jesus' blood on the cross. You became His Son if you accepted. Nothing changes that. But there is an obligation to behave as a son or a daughter of the King. What did James 2.20 say? Do you remember? That's a verse you're supposed to memorize. Starts out with you foolish or vain person without the, the capacity for truth and understanding. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless, of no value, of no worth? We've established that point. So are we going to live a life worthy of the calling that we have? Or are we going to make excuses, keep being distracted, not let God work on the hard spots in our, in our hearts, not add soil to where He needs to? We determine that the only thing that we should have is good soil. So Peter, an apostle, to who? To Jesus Christ. No one else, not in your devotion, not split or anything, but to Jesus Christ. We are God's elect, exile scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen. You were chosen by God, predestined. He knew it for you ever were even thought about before time began. He formed you in, in your mother's womb. According to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, one of the things that the Spirit does, besides sealing us and making us God's own child, the Spirit is there to sanctify us and walk us through each and every step of our life. Why? To be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. I could go on and on here about what that means, but I want to stay focused a little bit so that I'm not long-winded. Right, Chuck? Okay, Chuck will let me know if we are. But I want to make a few points here that we just read. Number one, we are chosen, right? Not just by God, number two, number two point. We've been, cho we've been chosen by God our Father. That's a special word that I was talking about that we saw in Luke when he taught us how to pray. I can call Barry a father, but I don't know him as my father. His children, though, can call him dearest father or daddy. Something totally, totally different than just Father. We can cry out by the Spirit, Abba, Father. Because He is our Father. Not just some Father, not just the Father of a nation of Israel, which the Old Testament refers to, but He is our personal Father who resides in heaven. Who is much better than any earthly Father who wants the best for you bar none. Wow, that we can call the God of all creation that rules heavens and earth, that speaks in their stars and, and there's life and things we can't even comprehend and we don't even know that's going on out there. And He chooses us to call, his own, call us His own child. Wow. 
Number three, God Himself is working out the process of sanctification to make us holy. I don't have to do it. The power of God lives inside of me. I have the power that I need. All I have to do is submit to that power. Number four, so that we will be obedient. Not partially obedient, but obedient. Five, to who? To Jesus and only Jesus. You can't have two masters. <clears throat> Six, we're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Now this means a lot. Like I said, we can go into that. But what I want to point out here today means that the cost was God's only Son on the cross for you and I. He suffered and He died so that we might live. And not only live, but live a life abundantly. That's why Luke is saying over and over again that the kingdom of God has come. And we see that transition where Jesus is saying, it's time for you to start following in my footsteps. I've told you who I am. I've made the proofs there. It's time to start following, to put your money where your mouth is, to put up or shut up, that actions are louder than words, whatever you want to say. Jesus is saying, are you going to? I don't want excuses. And he even says that the person who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back longingly to what they had doesn't realize what I did for them, that I shed my blood for them so that they would follow after me. And number seven, at the end of that verse, is grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace, not just grace, not just peace, Grace is something that we don't deserve, right? Over and over, unmerited favor. We just get it more and more and more. The more that we rely on Jesus, the more we give up our own selves, the more we get grace. We don't understand how abundant that grace is unless we just die to ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him daily. And then we get peace that surpasses all understanding. And we don't just get it. It says it will be yours. That's a fact. Not you might get it. It will be yours. And it will be yours in abundance. The King James Version says multiplied. So let me give you an answer. Who's math whizzes out here? Anybody? Come on. You're a math whiz, ain't you? Put your hand up. Anybody else good at math? Okay, let's see. <laughs> let's show you the difference in multiplication and addition. Okay? 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is what? 10. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, five of them, is what? Whoop, a little, little slower on the answer, aren't they? Come on. 32. It's not that hard. So if you decide that you're going to give all to God and He's going to give you grace and peace and He's going to give it to you in bigger numbers, let's choose eight. That's not that big a number, is it? Mmm. <laughs> They're looking like now He's putting us to the test. Eight plus eight plus eight plus eight plus eight is what? And you're using multiplication to figure that out too, see? Okay. <laughs> So now, what is 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8? You're close, but... <laughs> 32,768. So if I start doing and God starts giving me grace upon grace and He multiplies it because what I've done, look at what we can do. Look at the power of God in us. Look at how much He loves us and wants to multiply that peace and grace in your life. And I chose a small number again, 8, where we started. I hope you get the point. And I hope you see that multiplication is a little more tricky than addition, right? Verse 3 of 1 Peter 1. Praise be to God because He's done these things. And the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, in His great mercy, He has given us new birth. We're new creatures. We're born again into a living hope. Not just a hope for the future, but we live for it every day through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and a bonus here, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept, us in, kept, it is kept in heaven for you, for each and every one of us. Nothing can take that away. Who through faith are shielded by God's power, right now, until the coming of the salvation. So that means we're shielded now from the devil. He has no power over us. We are protected. We are His. Until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In all this you rejoice greatly. 
Rejoice greatly. Woo! Come on. Okay, that's what it says. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs of all kinds. Well, I don't like that, but it tells me I'm supposed to, correct? So if I'm following in the footsteps of Jesus, that's what I'm supposed to do. Because look at the reward that I'm going to have. Verse 7, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not know Him, you believe in Him. So the, here's the question. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you trust Jesus? And do your actions show it in your obedience? <clears throat> you believe in Him and are filled with inexpressible, inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. We know these things now, right? It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. You know, that hadn't appeared or been revealed to a lot of us, has it? Because we think we're serving ourselves. We think we live in the United States and we have a right to live the life that we have. But we were bought with a price. We were redeemed back. And that price was the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, because of all this, with minds that are alert and, and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But, just as He who called you is holy, so be kind of holy, right? Somewhat holy. Be holy. All. And it says, Be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Because I am holy. <clears throat> Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a... What word there? Father. Personally, you can call on Daddy in heaven. Wow. I, I, just, I cannot comprehend that every time that I think about it. That God would have me call Him my Father. Not just a father, but my father, who judges each person's work impartially. Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed or ransomed or purchased back from the empty way of life. Don't let Satan deceive you. All the promises of this world are empty. Handed down to you from your ancestors. But we were bought with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last time. For whose sake? Your sake. My sake. For Alan. For put your name in that spot. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 21. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by doing what? Obeying the truth. So that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply. From where? Your heart. Because that's what makes a difference. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God. For, quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, All people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flower of the fields. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And we know clearly what He is telling us to do as obedient children. And this is the word that was preached to you. 1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, everything we've just read, now do you get a better comprehension of what we're talking about when we say therefore? 
Verse 2, therefore now rid yourselves of some malice and some deceit. Is that what yours says? All malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and slander of every kind. The all's not there on the others, but it's implied. We don't need to doubt that it's not. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. And they do. So that by it, that spiritual milk that we drink up as fast as we can, when she sees a bottle, she's, ah, and she'll go follow you around wherever. Because she wants that bottle. <clears throat> so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. It's a process. Don't let Satan be beat you down. Don't let him beat you down when you have done something wrong. Say, how could God still love me? Because he's, he's your father and he loves his children. It's, it's totally clear. Don't think you can do anything to separate that love. If you are his child, there's the thing. If you believe in Jesus Christ then you are His child and He loves you no matter what. There are times when He's probably not very proud of me, but He loves me just the same and that will not change. It is a daily dying to myself, a daily sanctification process. Literally, as a baby grows up to maturity. Verse 3, Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you do what? You come to Him. To who? Jesus, the living stone, the one that was rejected by humans but chose by God and precious to God. He sacrificed his baby boy so that you might live. He crushed him so that our iniquities would be forgiven. <clears throat> so you also, like Jesus, the living stone, <clears throat> are being built a process to completion, right? We don't start a building and not finish it. Into a spiritual house. Literally the temple and the Spirit of God because He resides in us. To be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejects has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because what? They disobey the message. So what do you think we're doing when we're picking and choosing the parts we want? We're stumbling. We're serving another master, not Jesus Christ. We're saying to God that His precious Son was not good enough. So all we've got to do is repent, change our way of thinking, and come back to Him. And He's standing there just like the prodigal father waiting for His Son to return home. That's the movie we watched Friday, and it had a lot of direct comparisons there of how much that father loved his child no matter what. When that son showed back up at the doorstep, he started trying to explain. He said, I just love you. There was no explanation needed because the father loved the son no matter what. And we are God's children. <clears throat> they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So we've got to tell them the Word of God. God's special possession. Well, excuse me, I skipped. But you are a chosen people, verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, something that belongs to Him, something that's for His use and His purpose that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of the darkness into wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God and independently a child of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Whew, we could go home right now, couldn't we? And sing praises God, but I'm not done yet. Okay, Chuck? <laughs> You should be excited about what I just read. You should be longing to read more. You should have a hunger and a thirst. So that means it doesn't matter how long I preach, right? <laughs> just asking. You should be obedient, correct? Because you're receiving salvation of your souls. Wow. And we have a limited time to do this. There's an urgency here. Souls are at stake. Is this how you feel? 
It should be. Every Christian should have this desire. So we get to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. After we've seen the 70 go out and everything, we've seen Martha and Mary worshiping Jesus, and we see that Mary was distracted. She was trying to do her best. She thought she had to do all these things, but Mary was just worshiping at the feet of Jesus, clinging on to His every word, because she would only have Him for a little time, and she needed to soak up and absorb all that. So then chapter 11, verse 1 in the NFV starts out, One day. We've got a point here again to make. One day. It's a literal day at a literal place. Are you excited and on the edge of your seats to see what happens next? What did the disciples ask Him? They said, I see all this stuff. I'm excited. You sent us out. We cast out demons. We obeyed. We took nothing with us. And You provided all of our needs. When we see you praying all the time, Jesus, so teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us how to be like you. We need to learn to pray. So Jesus replies, right? So let's start looking at this. We'll look at the NIV first. And I'll read it completely, the first four verses. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples, he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, if you've got your Bible, mark that everyone, because there we kind of fall short, don't we? I don't mind forgiving this person at all, because I love them. I choose to love them, not how they make me feel or anything. It's not that funny feeling love. It's that love that keeps no record of wrongs. But that guy that's mean and nasty to me, I don't like forgiving him. So underline that word, everyone. Because it really matters, doesn't it? Because if love wasn't that way, Jesus would have never went to the cross, would He? Because we all were against Him. We were all putting the marks and whips upon His back, tearing the flesh out. We were all nailing the nails in His hands and feet. He did it because He loved even His enemies. That even while we were God's enemies, He sent His only Son to die for us. They've reached this aha moment. And they're saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, if you heard that prayer, it sounds a lot like the Lord's Prayer from Matthew, doesn't it? And some of your commentaries will tell you it's the same prayer. And absorb this and understand this. I'm not trying to teach hypocrisy or anything else. The Lord and I have sat down and prayed with this a lot. It's not the same prayer. Okay? It is a portion of the prayer, yes. It is from that prayer, but it has a different purpose here. So let's look at the NLT for a minute. The New Living Translation reads this way. One Jesus, one, once Jesus was in a certain place praying... As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. That's simply what hallowed means. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Very similar, right? The differences are the NLT defines hallowed for us, as I've said. The NLT says this is how you should pray versus when you pray. The NLT says may your kingdom come soon rather than just your kingdom come. Well, we should be praying that it comes soon. We should be ushering in the kingdom. The NLT says give us each day the food we need compared to give us each day our daily bread. And we're going to see that in a minute. That That's, that's probably a little more accurate of what these disciples were understanding. The NLT says, Forgive us our sins as we forgive, where the NIV says, Forgive us of our sins, for we also forgive. And I really like, which I told you to underline, that the NIV says everyone. The NLT doesn't say that. The NLT passage closes with, Don't let us yield to temptation, where the NIV says, Lead us not into temptation. Very close. So I'd say they're, they're pretty much saying the same thing. You may agree with me or not. Here's the King James Version, though. And I know some of you swear on King James. There's a lot of people out there that do. King James Version was written first. 
We have a lot more manuscript evidence now than we had then. So we look back at that and see some things. And we discovered this from this passage. And it came to pass, this is the King James Version, that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When, we, when ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive every one that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Now the word indebted is a truer meaning of what it is, because the word there is showing a debt. Okay, But if you notice, there's a lot of words that are in the King James that aren't in the NIV or NLT, right? Okay. A lot of times we think that the NIV or whoever just took these words out. Well, the reason that they took them out is not because they didn't want you to read them or anything else. It's because the manuscript evidence that we have today, some of the manuscript evidence is missing those texts. So they take them out. They take them out so there is more uniformity in God's Word. So people can't say, well, these things are, are not here. Well, if you take those out of Scripture, does Scripture still not say the same thing? The things that are missing from these textual documents may have been forgotten, may have been lost. It's hard to say. But they don't change the meaning of God's Word in the slightest. Okay? But I don't think that's what's happened here. And we have the manuscript evidence to prove it. When the scribes, after several hundred years, were rescribing this, they said, Oh, there's stuff missing here. We know that it's missing because it was recorded in Matthew. So let's fill in the blanks. Wow. If we fill in the blanks, we might be changing the meaning of what God said. We know what, is, what He said in Matthew. We know what the Lord's Prayer is. But the purpose and intent here, and Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, in His first basic teachings. He said, if you want to follow Me, here's the things you need to do. Times have changed here. He's on his last days heading to Jerusalem to die. He's got people that are following him, that have been sent out, that see demons cast out, that see that God will take care of their every needs. The things that are mentioned here, they have directly just seen. So when they're wanting, to, they're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives them an answer that says, here's how you hunger and thirst for more. When you pray, you don't need our Father anymore because I've already taught you that He is your Father. In Matthew, He was teaching them that you have a Father in heaven. Now they're already experienced it. So they get to just say, Father. They don't have to say, Our Father anymore. Which art in heaven. Well, guess what? God came from heaven to earth in Jesus Christ to save mankind for His sins. They realize that. So Jesus does not need to say that again. Hallowed be thy name. Of course we want Jesus' name to be hallowed. We want it to be made holy. That's what we're supposed to be doing by living our lives. So that others may see our works and it may glorify our Father who art in heaven. They know this part. Thy kingdom come. God's kingdom has come. Luke, Matthew say it. Jesus says it. And they say, teach us as John taught his disciples. Well, what did John teach? He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is coming, is at hand. Jesus taught the same thing. Repent, change your foolish way of thinking, because the kingdom of God is here. It is here through Jesus. They know this. <clears throat> Thy kingdom come. It's something that we want to continue to come as we look forward to when Jesus comes again. It's a process that's still going on and will continue to go on. A kingdom has a king, right? The two songs we sang about this morning talked about kingdom and a king. And we are supposed to be representatives of the king if we belong to that kingdom. The kingdom, if you want it to stand, has to fight off its intrusions. We fight a spiritual battle. It has a king that's in control and we hope and pray that that kingdom stands. In fact, we hope and pray that any opposing kingdoms fall, right? So there will be a time when there's only one kingdom 
And God says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. All things will be made right. So we need to pray that thy kingdom come. That's, we're going to continue to pray that till we're in glory. Thy will be done, as in heaven and on earth. Well, if you look back at Luke's teaching so far, these disciples already know that they have to look at the Master's will over their own. They've learned this step. As in heaven, as on earth, they've learned that we're fighting a spiritual battle. So then Jesus says, give us day by day, or each day, our daily bread. We just read in the chapter before, they learned this. Jesus said not to take anything, but yet their needs were supplied. And that teaches us even more that not only do we need to let Jesus supply our needs, but this is a daily matter. That He gives us what He deems necessary for that day. Does that mean that some will be rich and some will be poor? Sure, it still does. Riches aren't a sin. Abraham had plenty of riches. Solomon was the richest person ever. David was full of wealth. What the difference is, is that you allow God to give you what He desires to give you. David relied on God for his kingdom and gave God the glory, even though he was a terrible sinner in man's eyes. But he repented. He was a man after God's own heart. So it doesn't mean you'll be wealthy or not. You don't have to throw your wealth away. It means that you rely on God, not your own abilities, not your education, not your circumstances, but you rely on God to give you day by day what He gives you so that when you don't have the things that you had before, you're content, just like Paul says. He's in content when he's in prison and he knows his purpose now is that he can sit down in peace, in prison, peace, I use that term lightly, but writing letters to the churches to encourage them because they're going to be facing struggles. So he writes letters to them saying, it's not about your circumstances. God will provide for you day by day in spite of your circumstances. <clears throat> Give us our daily bread. Well, that doesn't mean just food, does it? Because Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We're talking physical and spiritual here. And forgive us of our sins, because like I said earlier, that's something we definitely have to, to talk about daily. As we forgive, or also forgive, or day by day as we forgive, those who sin against us. Because we see through the eyes and the heart of Christ. We see the ministry that He's doing. We see the purpose that He came. And lead us not into temptation. And then we don't have the part but delivers from evil. Why? <laughs> because Jesus has come. They hadn't seen the reality yet, but Jesus knows and is teaching everything. When He died on the cross, Satan said, Oh no. Right? Because He's been beaten. And when He rose again, He said, Oh no, even more, right? Because He rose again to give us life. So I don't think these words... Jesus forgot about. I don't think he forgot his prayer that he told the disciples. And this one probably doesn't say the Lord's Prayer over it if yours has headers. If it says anything, it should say the disciples' prayer because they were yearning and longing to be more like Christ. So they said, teach me how to pray, which we need to do every day so that we have an open communication line with our Father. When I was a little boy, I had no fear about my Father when I was a little boy. Now later on, I had some fears and reservations. I thought He was against me, especially when I became a teenager, right? They're always against me. But when I came to Him as a little child, I would get up into a tree, I'd see Him coming, I'd jump in His arms because I knew without a doubt, that He would catch me. I knew without a doubt He loved me. I knew without a doubt that He would provide for everything that I ever needed or anything else. And my dad's not a perfect dad by any means. But if you're saved, you have a perfect Father in heaven who wants you to call Him personally, Father, Daddy. He's standing there with arms open wide to catch you if you're willing to jump. His arms are strong. 
He won't drop you. He won't forsake you. He wants the very, very best for you. He sacrificed His only Son to save you. So what I'm asking today is, are you willing to jump into His arms or not? That's the kind of relationship that Jesus is teaching His disciples to have here. To pray, Father, hallowed be Your name. You are deserving of glory, honor, and praise. I want Your kingdom to come and I am willing to participate in the advancement of it. Thank You for giving me that opportunity and privilege. Give me what I need. Help me not to rely on the things of this world. Help me to not be deceived. Give me what I need, especially when I pray for Your Spirit so that I can minister more. When I realize that we're fighting a spiritual battle, forgive me of my sins. I don't want anything hindering my relationship with You. And learn, let me learn to love like Christ loved. To forgive even the unforgivable. To not let the day go down where I have anger and contentment for my fellow man. And lead me not into temptation. I know there's going to be trials and sufferings, but I know that you won't give me any more than what I can bear. And I know that it's to prove the genuineness of my faith. To bring about patience. To bring about genuineness. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach His disciples here. And we're going to read on and see more things. And we'll eventually get to Luke 12, where he's, Jesus says that He's gone away and left His servants behind. And we'll see what He says, because we were at Luke 12 a couple months ago, a few months ago. We'll get to that. But today, will you jump into your Father's arms? Father, we thank You so much for all that You do. We thank You for Your love. It is just amazing. We stand in awe of You. Hallowed is Your name, O God. Give us what we need, especially Your Spirit, to do the work that You have called us to do. We thank You so much that You would give us Your Son, that You would sacrifice Him for us. We thank You for Jesus' obedience. We thank You that He stood through sufferings far greater than we'll ever know, all this so that we could be brought back into a right relationship with You. It is Your will that we be sanctified and made holy, and I pray that Your Spirit is poured out upon each today, working out the process of sanctification in our lives. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, the Lamb that was slain for our sins. Amen.